title of this lesson this week, as you see, is You Think You Need a Bath. When I was young, when I was a child, I needed baths all the time. But I didn't know the significance of it, right? A lot of times when I was told to take a bath, I wanted to do it on my time, on my select schedule. I didn't understand the body odors and all that and how I had to have the odorant on and put the soap on my body in in order to be completely clean. My parents knew that and they were instructing me and my siblings as we were growing up. But if you were like me as a child, you wanted to play your games. You wanted to play with your toys. You wanted to watch the TV. And bath time was inconvenient. And it always happened when you were doing something. When you were minding your business, your parents always intruded on that. When you were younger. Then as you got older, obviously you understood what was going on. And the met the the scripture that I'm bringing to you all today, the passage of scripture, it comes from Second Kings, chapter five, and I'm reading again from the New International Version. And this <laughs> passage, it has a lot to do with a bath, and let's get into it now. Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant so soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his, ro his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how, see how he is trying to pick a curl with me? When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man... Come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet, a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. He was probably like happy, like, man, I'm about to be clean, like I don't have no more diseases. You know, because leprosy, that was a big deal. Especially in the Old Testament, um, reading Leviticus how when somebody had a disease, they had to go away or different things. They had to go away from the camp for a certain amount of days before they were declared clean. Because back then, they didn't have the medications that we had. And especially with the things handling the temple and how God is a God of, of order, of, of cleanliness. He gave them different rules to follow so they can be clean and they can be acceptable Entering in around the people and God was protecting them because they didn't have doctors like we have right now So 
man, he was probably happy. I'll be happy. I'm like, bro, I'm about to be clean, y'all. I'm about to be so clean. And then here's verse 10. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. So when you hear this message, right? And a lot of times God is telling us to do something. He's like, hey, go do this and you will be clean. Go serve here and you will be rewarded this. But that leads me to my first point. We want what we believe we deserve. We will pray all these things and, 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 and have these high moments where we're saying like, hey, God is moving in my life. He's doing this and that. And then when God is telling us to move to the areas where we don't want to go, then it's like, hey, God, like that's not a, what I asked for. Like you saw what I wrote down. This is what I said. And then we forget what God is telling us to do. And we forget that God's will is better than our will. He knows the outcomes of everything. He knows the beginning and the endings. So if he if he wanted to, he would have talked to us before he was like, Hey, I, I want to consider you into this, right? I want I want to have a meeting, a corporate meeting with you, just you, so I can discuss what you want you know, to work in with these plans. No, that's not the case. Because we don't know, we don't know anything apart from what God is telling us to do, what he is instructing us to do. And then in verse 11, it says, But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. That's crazy. Because, like, I don't know what it is about the Jordan where he, 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 he was going, but like from, you know, kind of guessing from his experience, he's saying, hey, this water is not, it's dirty. I want to go to like the rich water. Like I want to go to this, to these bodies of water and <laughs> water is water. You know what I'm saying? Water is water. If you dip in the water, like God said, like you're going to be clean. Or what if he went to the other rivers and he got a disease? His, his, his mindset is limited. And that's how we are at times. We're thirsting for something more and we're, we're praying and, and we're seeking God and we're reading his word and we're studying and we know God. Or we think we know God. And then when it get to it gets to those seasons of life where we're at those crossroads, those trials where God is like, hey, I'm calling on you to go here. And all that time of preparation, you're preparing for the wrong thing. You're pre you're preparing for what you think God is calling you to. That's been me. I've been there before. And those times, like Naaman. God led me to different waters. He was like, hey, stay in this water right now. If we go to these new tides, these new tidal waves, I'm going to protect you, but you're still going to get hurt because that's the consequence of you moving prematurely to <laughs> where I'm calling you to go. And Naaman almost did that. Naaman's servants went to him and said, and this is a good part of having people in your corner that are listening as well. They're listening to what is being said. And they're saying, like, hey, like they, they give you a little heart check. So Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be, and be cleansed? 
So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored, he became clean like that of a young boy. It is amazing how even though we try to run away from God's calling on our lives, from God's clean, uh, 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 cleaning process, how he restores us. And point number two is we need a bath. We need a bath. The king needed to be clean, not just physically, but spiritually. If God would have allowed him to go his own way, if God would have uh, uh, and not have taught him the lesson of humility, the king would have still had the same character, the same heart posture. And today he's calling, God is calling you to do something different, to change up your routine. And it's not just, don't just read the Bible just to read the Bible. Read the Bible Read the word, pray, worship, and allow that to be a part of your life. And now we're at the best part in the story. After Naaman listened to his servants and listened to Elisha, finally, he's there. He's at the point of his uh, uh, of being clean. In the number seven, in... Uh, in the Bible, it, it talks about how it's a number of complete, uh, of fulfillness, of being comp complete. And that that's a holy number, the number seven. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world. Accept in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept it then. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. And going back earlier, uh, something that just stood out to me is how Elisha, he didn't come. He, he didn't go with Naaman to the waters. And sometimes you will have leaders in your lives where you're, you're clinging on to and you want them to go to every area you're going to. But their job is to instruct you, to build you up, to teach you what you're supposed to be doing. So when you go out, they, they're still in the areas where they are, right? In the seasons where you just left. And they're pushing you out. And like, hey, you go here. I can't do everything for you. You go here. I'll see you around the way, but you go here. God is calling you to this to this area right here. And Elijah was like, God is, even though you don't see it yet, God is calling you to this area, to this river, to this water. You're thirsty. Here you go. You'll go to this physical water. And then that will lead you to the spiritual water. That will lead you to the living well. That will lead you to God, to Abba Father, to our provider, to, J to Jira. Like, man, it's crazy. It's crazy how influential leaders are and how important students are as well. And it, it, it's very important for the students to listen to the leaders and also for the leaders to push out those they are training up. If you are not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as the pair, as a pair of mules can carry. For your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Ramon, to bow down, and he is leaning on my uh, my arm, and I have to bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. 
go in peace, Elisha said. Ramon is an idol. Um, and that's man, that's powerful too. And how in this quick moment, Naaman he he uh, he he's he seen like his ma like he he respects his master, but he sees how like hey he's out of line as well with the idols in his life, and God eradicated that out of Naaman's life, and now he is putting himself in the position of creating change in the areas where he runs was. And that might be you, where you you think that you can't have a voice of change, but you can. You can, and you will have a voice of change. I'm declaring that right now. You will have a voice of change, but you have to be willing to make that voice. Even when somebody is standing, like even when somebody is leaning on your arm and doing things that you know they shouldn't be doing, you can be there and speak life into them. You don't even need to be there uh, when they're doing this certain activities or saying certain things, but you can be there in their corner and supporting them through prayer. And the rest of the scripture, it gets it gets crazy. And this part, it's about uh, Gehazi. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, so after after every night thing that happened, Gehazi's Elijah's servant that was witnessing everything, he was around the man of God. He he had a dirty heart. He had a dirty heart. Then he went to the to the water and got clean and got a uh and got cleansed. Gehazi needed to be there right with him. <laughs> Even though he didn't have leprosy, he didn't have a fit physical disease his man spiritually that's that's far worse like physical man you can hey that's nothing but spiritually your heart like that's man that's a whole different thing to work on that's a whole different hey that's a whole different area to work on so after Naaman had traveled some distance. Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman. This Ar Armen Armenian. By not accepting from him what he brought? As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. This reminds me of Jonah and how Jonah, he thought the Ninevites, he was like, hey, Man, y'all don't deserve me saved. You doing all this other stuff. And we over here being persecuted, speaking speaking on behalf of God, even though God told me to deliver to speak to you all. And he's trying to show mercy to y'all. I don't understand why. I don't understand why he's doing that. I don't like y'all at all. At all. And even after he said all these things, he said like he said like three words after he was spit up on the the shore. He was like, hey, man, if y'all don't get your basically like if y'all don't get your act together, y'all y'all did. And in that moment, boom, their lives turned around. And he was still mad that he they got saved. That's crazy. And I feel Gehazi is in the same position position. He was like, man, like he didn't like Naaman. Like, hey. But he he liked his money. He liked his status. But he didn't like him. And with that, how you view the outside world, like, hey, this person is like this, this person is this, and how how can we declare the character of somebody's heart that is being changed by God? We're not God ourselves. How can we pass judgment? It's quick and easy to say, hey, you're not speaking the word of God, you're not doing X, Y, and Z. And, and and act like we're speaking from a place of accountability, but but we're actually speaking from a place of of hatred. It's different when you're challenging somebody, and it doesn't even have to be somebody who is a Christian. It can be just anybody that like somebody who's not a Christian. It's in their lives. It's easy to challenge somebody, and not have. It's easy to challenge somebody and judge them, but it's it. It's better when you establish a relationship with them. 
and then you establish a level of accountability. So when you do that, then you're respected with your with your approach, and you're not coming from a place of hatred or being vengeful or trying to be gossiping about what is going on. You're actually invested in their lives. And that's something for me with working with the students. I'm invested in their lives. I might just like saying jokes about them behind the back. Like, no, like, I'm not saying they're bad student. No. I want to invest in their lives. And if I can invest in their lives right now, hey, their only, their foundation is building. Their foundation is building up. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? He asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them and then tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. Man, it was probably some Prada in there, some, some Louis Vuitton. He gave them two to two of his servants and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When the Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the man away, and they left. When he went in and stood before his master, Elijah asked him, Where have you been, Gehazi? Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elijah said to him, was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes or olive groves and vineyards or flocks and her or in herds or male and female slaves? Name his leprosy will cling to you into your descendants forever. Woo! Then Gehazi went from Elijah's presence, and his skin was leprous. He had become as white as snow. It is beautiful and crazy how the start of chapter 5 started with Naaman having leprosy, having this physical disease. And this, and this man was, hey, he was loyal to a T. He went to his king, told him what was going on. He, they sent a letter like he was he was the commander of the army like he was loyal and he did all these things even his uh his wife mistress knew about the prophet and Naaman he willingly went to to these next levels but then he had a stumbling block a small it was it wasn't that big but it was a small stumbling back block where he was told to go somewhere and he refused at first. And sometimes we do that. We, we we refuse at first to go to the river, to go to the waters where God is calling us to, to go to the areas of life God, but God is calling us to. But when his servants and different people around him coached him up and was like, hey, like, if he if he told you to do a great feat, wouldn't you have done it? And name it in that moment, he listened. He was like, all right. All right, like he was probably thinking in his head, like, man, you're right, like, you're right. Yeah, like he did all these things. You're right. Like I'm complaining about nothing, and he did that, and he completed what he was set out, what he was supposed to do, and God blessed them. But then at the end, Gehazi, the person who was with Elijah all that time, all that time, and that is, that is crazy in a sense where. We can be connected to the vine. We can be connected to God, but it doesn't mean we're producing good fruit. So, 
it, like the, our, our, our branch, hey, branches on trees, you, we see them all the time. Some of them are alive, some of them might be dead. You're still connected to God. But you might be dead spiritually. You're not, you might not be producing fruit. It might be you're not allowing God to use you in certain ways. It might be how you're acting to certain people. And then Gehazi's, um, uh, uh, and, uh, and with Gehazi, with his heart, he was like that. How he was responding. And I, I wonder if all that time he was sitting there, he was like, man, like he was envious of all these blessings happening to other people. But he was ready for his own. But he was moving too fast. He was moving through areas where God was not allowing them to go. He was like, hey, I did not call you to be a thief. I did not call you to be envious. And you're stealing from the man that I just blessed. And <laughs> Elisha, your master, was willing to fulfill what I told him to do out of a servant heart. And his reward is in the kingdom. And even if he does get monetary reward, that will happen at a later season when it's the right time. But you're stepping out. Like, man, you're stepping out. You're, you're bugging. You're stepping out. You're tweaking. Like, what are you doing? And because of that, now he's, his descendants in him will have leprosy. So today, be willing to take a bow because you stink. You stink. We all stink. Take a bath. And, hey, you can't you can't just take a bath with soap. You got to have the water. And God is clean. It, it, it's cleansing our souls, cleansing our lives. And that wraps up uh, this mini-series of thirst. And until next time, peace.